Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, March 20th, 2018. We are at Vets Hall in Morro Bay. This is the regularly scheduled March meeting of the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee. Um, all members are present except for John Irwin, so we have a quorum present. Uh, therefore, I'll call the meeting to order. We'll have a short moment of silence, please. Okay, let's rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, meeting is called to order. I'll open it up for public comment on anything not on the agenda or that for which you cannot stay. Seeing none, close public comment. And that brings us to A1, the consent calendar. That is the approval of the minutes for the February 20th, 2018 meeting. I want to thank my vice chair, John Martin, for chairing that meeting in my absence. And um, I didn't have any correction of the minutes. Are there any other? Corrections, comments, or can I entertain a motion to approve? Um, okay, so can I have a motion then to, only, unless you have a call? I'll move to approve. Okay, second, I'll second. Second. Okay. Dave, second. Thank you. Um, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That was consent calendar minutes from last month's meeting, A1. Uh, please note all members are in attendance now. John Irwin is also here. Thank you. Item B1, uh, brief finance department update on OpenGov and the CSMFO. That will be conducted by the finance director, Jennifer Cowway. Jennifer, I can turn it over to you. Hello, thank you. Um, just wanted to continue our update, updates on OpenGov. We've um, gotten the chart of accounts uploaded at this point and three quarters-ish of the historical data. I thought we'd have it all um, updated, but I got impatient over the weekend with the last final one. So um, we're having to do it month by month for the last five years. So we're doing, you know, like 60 different reports that, oh, Val finished today. So I guess we're uploaded. Thank you, Val. Um, so we're all uploaded and now they'll put that in the portal and we'll start going through and reviewing to make sure it's been updated accurately and um, start generating the reports and getting the training. So we hope to be live within about a month um, for OpenGov. Um, and we'll have, that should be about the time of our next meeting. So the idea is as we go into budget, that'll be kind of done and, and um, okay. we'll be able to focus on budget, um, the budget hearings and that sort of thing. Um, and then for CSMFO, we just wanted to um, discuss a little bit with the committee what we learned at the conference. Um, Val and I both attended. Um, we heard some great seminars on sales tax and trends with sales tax. So we know the brick and mortar shops are not as um, fruitful as they once were unless there's another kind of attraction that's bringing people out. So um, we heard an interesting um, presentation from the president of Westfield Shopping Malls and how they're kind of revitalizing the shopping malls into kind of mini town centers to bring people out. So gyms, grocery stores, medical facilities, um, and a lot of restaurants mm -hmm. and a few stores to kind of um, you know bring people to those. Also heard, um, met with our PERS, a PERS actuary, not our PERS actuary, a PERS actuary one-on-one -on -one, um, and had some conversation with them about different options and we're continuing those conversations um, to make some recommendations um, within the next month or so on, on actions we can take that would best suit our situation here and, and our cash reserves. Um, and then I thought I'd let, this was Val's first time attending, so I thought I'd let her share with you a little bit on what her experience was. Go ahead, Val. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was really, really honored to have Jen um, invite me and bring me in um, as part of that trip. Um, it was very, very informative. Um, definitely, 
as someone who's pretty new to government, um, put together a lot of pieces for me of things I've been working on and um, just making sense of the bigger picture of what I'm doing here mm -hmm. and where I fit in. Um, and yeah, we talked a lot about pension. That was a big, big topic. Um, so I know what we're up against. And um, but yeah, it was really fun um, as well as informative. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, before we move on, um, for the public's benefit, the first thing was the OpenGov and the software system, and um, you're already using some of that in the reports I've seen, so, uh, right? Um, no, we haven't been using the portal yet. Um, we've okay. been discussing our progress and getting everything updated in the mm -hmm. weekly, bi-weekly manager's memo. Um, okay. Everything that we're reporting so far is kind of self derived out of the finance New department. World. Yeah. Okay. So when do you expect that to be up and running and on the website so that the public could see it if they so desire? Or do you have a date yet? Is it still being implemented? I, I think we'll have, we have the data uploaded now, so that's great. Um, we have to go through the the one custom report's going to be on the wharf, so we'll mm -hmm. get we'll work with them on that next to get that developed have some training so we know how to run additional reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully within a month we'll have okay. finished that and then we'll be able to roll out for the community and have some kind of discussion here on what training and you know mm -hmm. maybe work mm -hmm. through that and how we want to roll it out for the public. Right. Okay, so basically you can't just flip a switch and turn it on and run reports like any other system most of us have used, but you're making progress and in a couple months we'll all be able to benefit from it, hopefully. Thank you for that. And then on the conference, um, do you, is there typically any kind of uh, trip report or summary or anything else done? Um, no, not, okay. not that I'm aware of, and there hasn't been in other jurisdictions. I just, um, we kind of reported out in the weekly man, man, manager's memo that went out last week. Um, but okay. given the timing of this, thought it would be nice to have Belle kind of report on her experience and what we learned. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. All right, thank you. I just have a Quick, Go yeah. ahead, Don. So there is, a mistake, there is a typo in the minutes under business item C saying uh, council member Irwin. I'm sorry? There is a typo in the minutes oh, okay, that I found. Okay. Oh, okay. I knew it was there. It took me a second to find it. But um, under business items number three, committee member Addis, blah, 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 council member Irwin. Asked about that, yes. Oh, it shouldn't be council so, member. Right, it should so, be yeah, committee, <laughs> committee member. member. But I actually had a super... Just very, very briefly, if there were any major takeaways from um, the workshop that you attended on PERS that we don't, I mean, we already know it's, you know, doom and gloom, but any other takeaways? <clears throat> so I would say both in our one-on-one -on -one session with the actuary, and there were several larger scale sessions that, you know, the whole conference attendance was, was invited to. Um, PERS is really messaging that they want to work with communities on a one-on-one -on -one basis because everybody's solution is a little bit different. It mm -hmm. depends on um, your cash needs or your cash flow, your reserve levels. Um, it, you know, there's so many variable factors and the options are very different from a 115 trust to a fresh start option where you'd pay it down in 15 or 20 years instead of the 30 um, or selecting an individual basis. So there's about eight different basis that go into our rates, and you can pick just one of those and pay that off, and it'll change your, um, your rates going forward. So I think that's the message everybody heard loud and clear, is that we want to work with you. Um, they did talk about the future changes with the um, prospectively changing the period to 20 years for um, new basis going forward. We don't really have a good sense of what that means because we don't know what those bases are yet, but um, there was some conversation about that. And um, they did have their whole kind of executive team there. So the chief actuary, the CFO, the CEO, um, all there and available and, and taking questions and criticism as it, as it came. So um, in addition to that, uh, Valerie and Sandy just attended a PERS um, workshop down in Solving. Um, I think that was that last week now. Um, and Bartell, who is, it wasn't John Bartell, but Bartell and Associates, that's an actuary up in the 
actuarial firm in the Bay Area. Um, one of their employees came down and gave a presentation. Um, and maybe Sandy or Val might want to elaborate a little bit more on that. But it, I'm not sure it was anything new. I think it was just kind of reiterating what we already had heard. Yeah, I think um, it was really similar that the message, you know, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution for every um, city or every town. And um, just that going over the different options and picking and choosing what works best to try to tackle this. Thank you. Any other comments from? All right. Thank you for that update. And I assume if you come up with any innovative solutions or very differing strategies, you would bring it back to council and CFAC or and or. Okay. Yeah. It, it's some of that will depend on timing, of course, because mm -hmm. of you know sure. the CFAC. But we'll definitely be communicating those. And then I would suggest that maybe we um, rescind the motion and redo it for the minutes to add that correction. Oh. Okay. Then. Yeah. Update the motion to approve the minutes as amended with the correction. Thank you, Don. All right, so that brings us to item two today, B2, which is the presentation of the CAFR report. Um, the three attachments included in your agenda packet were the CAFR report and the internal um, so all of you have those to take home today. Thank you, Jennifer, for providing those. And then um, I guess, Jennifer, you would like to, I thought we were going to have the visitors, but unfortunately from the Poon Group, unfortunately they are not here. So Yeah, um, so I apologize for that. Um, it was after we published on Friday that they um, sent a message saying there was a scheduling conflict. So okay. um, the challenges of having a phone-in discussion, I they're, they will be present for the uh, council meeting. But um, Sandy, you know, I first want to thank Sandy and, and Susan as well. Um, the audit was well underway by the time I started. And, um, you know, we've been kind of just finishing up since then. Um, but Sandy and Susan really did the majority of the work on this. So I wanted to thank them for that. Um, the, the audit, you know, the main takeaways for me are what do we need to do going forward? Um, so the, there was three recommendations in the audit. There are three significant deficiencies is how they are categorized. Um, a significant deficiency is less serious than a material weakness, but still, you know, something we need to address. Um, in general, you know, we agree with all three of the findings, um, and mm -hmm. we've kind of outlined what our approach will be. Um, realistically, the, the first finding with accounting policies and procedures, that was in the prior year's audit as well. Just given the transitions that have occurred, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't realistic that that was going to get addressed. So we did expect that. Um, my biggest concern in that finding has to do with the um, purchasing software that we do need to get updated. Um, we've made some changes with um, doing quarterly budget reports, which I think is going to be helpful. Um, the cash balancing had already, that process had already been changed. We have another person from another department come over every morning and, and balance our cash. So there's um, sufficient internal controls um, involved there. Um, CityWorks is a another kind of electronic portal that's being implemented, and that is that is in the very final stages. So we're actually getting some training um, on that, and that should um, prove to be helpful in, in kind of collaborating with some of those standalone systems. Um, so we'll reevaluate um, at the time when that comes up. And then for policies and procedures, you know, that is a big, that is a big issue, but again, it's a, time, a timing issue. So we're going to focus on that. We're going to try to get those put together, and, and hopefully for the next year's audit, we'll at least have a good um, start to that. It might not be completely fully implemented, but um, we will have a start with that going forward. Um, there was also the finding about the city's finance organization. You know, that, that I would say is my, my number one goal is we need to stabilize our staffing in the finance department and have some consistency. Um, so to me, that's an immediate, yes, we concur and we have to do that. Every time we have turnover, it delays everything from moving forward because there's a training period. There's, um, you know, it's not just it's our whole city system that we have to get used to, our chart of accounts. So 
it creates a significant delay when we have turnovers. So that's my kind of number one focus, um, followed by the PO system. Um, for different reasons, but those would be the two focus. So hopefully, stabilizing the department can occur immediately. Um, the PO system, I have gone in and kind of played around with it. It needs to have some of the background um, done, work uploaded to it in terms of departments and, and accounts and kind of the tree for that. So um, we'll work on that, and that's kind of an 1819 target for me at this point. Um, and then the third recommendation, internal controls over recording of expenditures. This one is really speaking to the accruals that we discussed um, when we did our Measure Q um, first quarter update and year end update for 16-17. Um, there were five um, larger accrual amounts that didn't get accrued back. And when the auditors did their sampling, um, they found the five subsequently asked staff to go back through and, and sample everything and see how many more we missed. Um, there were a ha the handful of additional ones, some of them very minor, so they didn't have us make adjustments for those. But um, again, I think that speaks directly to kind of the stabilization of the department and getting staff trained and know what they're looking for. We have a, se a separated AP system where departments are entering their own um, accounts payable I think we're, I'm kind of toying with the concept of bringing that back in. I, I think that might help create some better controls is to train one person to do that and, and monitor it um, in, in finance. So we're looking at possibly doing that. Um, and that would involve reorganizing responsibilities with the existing staff. So we're not thinking of hiring anybody else, but maybe trying kind of switching up some of the responsibilities. Um, and then a couple of the accruals, quite frankly, you know, staff felt that they had fixed them, but it was just not understanding that how the system had worked. So that was a learning process with the new staff on board, and now we know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't, I, I agree we need to accrue everything back, and I think we've kind of resolved what happened in that year and have some plans moving forward. Um, there were some questions um, that Chairwoman Spagnola, you submitted. Um, do you want me to go through those now? Yeah, first of all, did you get any other questions uh, from anybody else? You hadn't sent it on, okay. So um, I think for the, it's, it's quite an exhaustive report, and I suspect you would have had more questions maybe if we had more time. But in general, um, I would like to go through some of the questions because I think that may help explain to some of the committee members what we were looking for. Um, and, and then we can comment on that. Because I think this is a very important document. I think it's excellent that the city does it. I, don't, I, I personally agree with a lot of what I read that I understood. And, um, but I, I don't want to just say the committee approved it if they haven't really gone through it in detail. So, so. And, and you know, I, I do want to say that the committee reviewed the CAFR last year and you provided a lot of great recommendations for the MDNA and transmittal. And when I say we were doing this right down to the deadline to get it published in terms of the MDNA mm -hmm. and the transmittal, that's probably even an understatement. Um, numbers were still changing while we were writing the MDNA. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I apologize. We didn't get to take into account those. Um, considerations. We were trying to get a product done. Mm -hmm. um, next year, we have our, our interim audit scheduled for May, May 30th, I think, um, end of May. And, um, you know, we're going to be more on target and have, the plan is to have more time okay. and we will accurately um, address those recommendations that were previously pointed out. So I do apologize for that. Okay. No worries. I'll be happy to just go through the questions if you'd like. Uh, Everybody okay with that? Okay, so my first question was on page 19 on the CAFR report. And basically, it said the unfund unfunded pension liability, here we go again, but this is one of the key items, uh, for the end of last year, June 2017, was $21.7 million. But then when I went back to last year's report, that was 17.8. So my first question is, that's an increase of 3.8 million, that's significant, over 20%. Is that accurate, and is there any explanation for it? It is accurate. Um, 
You would expect it to go up, and you expect it to go up because we have committed promises to retirees that are either going up or down, depending on what the market's doing. Mm -hmm. We're accumulating um, promises on a daily basis for people that are currently working. So you do expect it to go up. The, the 3.8 million, 1.6 million of that is safety related, and 2.2 million is for the miscellaneous classifications. Um, that's where you, you know the 3.8 comes from. It's primarily attributed to the interest. Um, these numbers for the report are based off the state pool as a whole, and we're allocated what our percentage is with respect to the state pool and an interest rate. So when we went back, when this question came in, we went back and looked at the um, supporting documentation, and it all boiled down primarily to interest. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I don't. You may have to slow this down. Uh, um, the discount rate didn't change until last fall, right? Which is after this fiscal. So, are you talking about you know lowering the discount rate from the 7.65 or whatever it was a percent as was talked about, or is this interest on some investments? This is the city share of the interest. Okay. For the whole state pool. So okay. um, that kind of leads into your next question about the 7.65% um, that they re referenced. The state pool has the 7.5% interest rate that we all refer to and know is assigned to us in Morro Bay and every other city that's changing. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there's a 15 basis points for admin expenses that the state assigns to the pool. Oh, okay. So all of these numbers take into account a 7.65% rate for that administration. Okay, so when we're always hearing that it's, it was 7.5% may go down to 6.5%, you still have to tack on another 0.15%, right, for the admin. That's for this reporting. Okay. Uh, that's for okay. the governmental reporting piece of it. If, if you pull our specific actuarial mm -hmm. report, the, mm -hmm. the rate is 7.5% and we'll start incrementing down. Okay. But okay. when we go to do GASB 68 and the kind of the governmental accounting piece of it, they, they tack on an admin okay. and that's 15 okay. basis points. That's why you see those different percents. Mm -hmm. All right, that was a little confusing. Um, interesting. Um, so what do we think it's going to be the next year? If it went up $3.8 million from the previous fiscal year to the last fiscal year being audited, how much more is that going to go up next? Do we have any clue, idea? I don't have a specific number, okay. but I would okay. expect it to go up more than that because the rate's going to go down. Okay, okay. All right, so this is serious. All right. Okay, so yeah, my I next. Ask a quick yeah, question? go ahead on yeah. that one. Yeah. I'm just, you know, kind of sitting here as a layman saying, is it take 7.5% return in order to keep the system solvent? What? 7.5 is the expect. Go ahead. So our the actuarials base our rates off of what they expect the return mm -hmm. to be, the investment returns to be. They use a, I think it's seven-year average. I might be wrong on the number of years, but they use an average over a period of time. Yeah. Um, and at one point when we were overfunded, um, way back when, you know, that brought our average up quite a bit because they were earning like 20% interest. I mean, it was a huge number. Um, and then we started going into these, you know, zero right. percent kind of times. So that's why they're lowering, lowering the interest down from seven and a half to seven percent, and they're phasing that in. Um, the discussion is that we think that's still too high, but cities can't really absorb any more than that because every time they lower the interest rates down, it causes our um, liabilities to go up and what we owe them to go up. So um, PERS is trying to make the fund stable. Um, they feel 7% is a reasonable estimate based on those averages. So at this point, they're comfortable and they're not going below the 7%, but at one point, they were talking about 6.5%. Thank you. Okay. All right. So then, um, I think page 68. The next question I had was on page 74. So what is that chart saying with respect to the liability? The ex explanation on the next two pages was very difficult to understand. It was the actuarial. I don't know that you expect us to comprehend that, but I would hope somebody from the staff <laughs> understands that. And, and specifically on page 74, when it talks about the net change, the pension liability and the fiduciary, then it subtracts those numbers for the plan. 
it would seem to me you would add them, but I couldn't figure it out. So the, what I think the important takeaway from the chart on page 74, plan total pension liability, that is those numbers, $43.4 million is how much our plan, um, what our liability is as of 630-16. Plan fiduciary net position, that's the market value of our assets that we have in the plan. So oh. if we cashed out, that's how much we have. So the market value went down, so in addition to the shortfall, you have to... Right. Right. Okay. And then the the net pension liability, that's the difference to, between those two columns. So mm -hmm. that's our un, that's when you hear that UAL, unfunded accrued liability. Mm -hmm. That's what that amount is. So if we um, had to pay everything out today, you know, that we've promised, we would be $11.7 million short. Okay. And you liquidated and because the market was done or didn't right. reach that 7.5 anticipated rate of return. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Did you understand, though, the explanation on pages 75 to 77? Did someone look at that? <laughs> we read it as much as, you know, it, it's an actuarial explanation, but that is summed up, that's what you get to is we're underfunded by, you know, $12 million in the okay. miscellaneous and $10 million in the safety. Thank you. Um, also, on page 77, what are the post-retirement benefits specifically? Is that health benefits or what is that? Retiree health. Retiree health, okay. Mm -hmm. And they pay a portion of that and then the rest of it, the retirees pay a portion of that and the rest is funded by the city or the pension fund. That, that's correct. I'm not sure what the por portion is the retirees pay, but... Okay. When it said other benefits, it was little. Okay. Questions? Uh, John. Yeah, Jennifer, is, is that money in an irrevocable trust, the OPEB money? Yes. It's a is it with... I, I, ICMA. ICMA. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so page 85, this has to deal more with budgeting and that. Uh, notes, notes to the basic financial statements. And it looks like in the general fund, specifically admin, uh, fire, and public works, that the expenditures were significantly over the appropriations. So is there an explanation for that? I thought we would be doing like mid-year budget and moving things around or... So some of when Sandy has gone through in, in the detail of what appears to have been allocated into those categories that wasn't budgeted for mm -hmm. and there wasn't an, an adjustment. Some of them are related to um, legal fees for somebody outside of our city attorney for personnel related events that came up. Um, there was There's a variety of expenditures that came up. I, I can't tell you why there wasn't a budget adjustment um, for those, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't here. What I can tell you is that we are having conversations internally about what our budget expectations are, practices are, and mm -hmm. what they are going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and this came up at the last council meeting as well. And so we're having those conversations so that as the city staff, we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have those conversations with the council um, in the committee as we get into budget hearings um, so that we're all in, on the same page as understanding of mm -hmm. what do you need to go back for a budget adjustment for, what is a budget transfer, where does the city staff have authority you know, to transfer between line items versus adding new appropriations. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, the past is the past. I don't I have a lot of answers mm -hmm. for that, but going forward, um, mm -hmm. we're all getting on the same page as to what we mm -hmm. expect. <laughs> Thank you. And and I'm not trying to, you know, uh, admonish anybody for what's gone on the past as well as all the uh, different personnel, but it was always my understanding, typically within a department, you can move funds around as long as you do the correct paperwork, but then outside departments, you know, adjustments over a certain amount I would expect would go back to either city manager or city council, depending on the size. So that's why I'm kind of surprised when I see an auditor and these significant, it almost begs the question, you know, 
what are the consequences of overrunning the budget? And I thought that's why we're having a lot of quarterly and um, mid-year reviews so that we can get these. So it sounds like you're, you have the same goal as what I would recommend based on reviewing this. Go ahead, John. I question for you. Um, and you weren't here last year, so appreciate that. But it was part of the problem that the department managers were not getting the necessary feedback from finance in regards to where they were in their budget for the, you know at any particular point of the year, or were they getting timely reports that showed them that they were over budget uh, year to date, so to speak? So I'll let Sandy weigh in here in a minute. But I mean, there was a mid year done last year, so. Um there was conversation with that. And we have three department heads here that if they're welcome to add in if they'd like to. I think there's been some, ex and some departments do a really great job of going on and tracking their own department budgets and pulling it on a regular basis. Um, some departments hadn't been shown how to do that or didn't either transitions at their department levels. They didn't, they lost that somewhere along the way. Um, now we are doing those first quarter reports, so that involves a conversation with all the departments. Um, we had conversation with mid-year, and we'll have conversation with third quarter. So we're tracking it more closely in finance, but the expectation still is departments need to track that as well. So there's that kind of double check on it. But Sandy can add if she'd like. Uh, my, what I observed is that uh, all directors and managers had access in our new world accounting system to run their own budget performance reports. And it was there, there was not an expectation that we would generate those reports and send them to them and, and highlight where they're over or anything. But it was there, you know, that was what they were supposed to be monitoring. But I believe that, you know, probably what gets measured gets done. And probably if there was a specific action step out of finance where you generated that report, sent it out, pointed out where they were over, it probably would bring more focus to to looking at those variances and taking action. But in the past, no, there was not a, an obligation by finance to send those reports out. Has there ever been any thought about doing um, a monthly budget, you know, a planning, a spending plan, so to speak? Um, so the way, the way it's done now is you do these quarterly reports and you really are just comparing this year to last year and then making judgments about whether a budget amendment is needed based on any variances between the two years. But there's no analysis of this is where we are at six months compared to where we think we should be after six months. There's no monthly spending plan in the budget as far as I can tell. We don't, we don't spread the budget. Um, I don't know if that, when you think about some of our contract services, spreading the budget between months wouldn't really be realistic because you might pay them all out at the end of the contract or in installments throughout, depending on when there are different performance metrics. Um, I think we can do a, a better job and what we're going to try to do is more monthly monitoring so once the PO system is up, you'll have money encumbered. So that will kind of be set aside and know it's spent. Um, and I think that will help with where are we compared to where we thought we should be. Um, and as we generate these reports monthly, because even if the department, my philosophy is even if the departments are responsible for monitoring that, and they should be, Finance is ultimate responsible, ultimately responsible for making sure we stay within what the council has appropriated. So at the end of the day, it's on us, um, and we need to do that on a regular basis. The quarterly reports we're providing to the committee and the council, they do compare trends, right? And that's kind of how we know where we're doing. But on a monthly basis, the conversation should be very different, and it should be, does this make sense? for where we are in the first month of the year? Does this make sense to where we are in the eighth month of the year? Um, so, I, I mean, I think we can improve on that and we're working towards that. Okay. It's understood that expenses don't happen the same all through the year and, and we know revenues don't come in the same all during the year and uh, capital outlays are really uh, hit and miss, but um, does your software at least give you that capability? Can you program a budget quarterly or monthly or does it not have that capability? The software that would allow us to spread it monthly, or we can spread it monthly based on a percentage, based on historicals, 
uh, spending from the prior year, you know, 75% of it was spent in the first month, you know, the budget could be spread to put it in the first month. Those kinds of spreads could happen. Uh, they have not in the past spread the budget monthly because they didn't feel like it, it was really a significant comparison because of the timing of things come in in lumps and payments go out in, in, in concentrated periods of time. But they do, they always did a mid-year comparison to look at where they were at mid-year and be able to project if this is where I am at mid-year, do I expect that I can maintain this spending pattern through the rest of the year and come in, you know, by the end of the year. I know that was done last year, you know, by all the directors and brought, I think that was brought to the city council. I can tell you we've had this discussion for years on CFAC, two years ago, three years ago, on the encumbrance accounting and the, at the time, inability of the system to easily uh, track, track those commitments and that. Uh, so I suspect it was done at the department level from what I understand. John. Um, my experience doing budgets and tracking expenses and stuff, Unless you know what the contracts and mm -hmm. are for what the expenditures are, you're not going to be able to come up with a rational expenditure plan or whatever you want to call it to compare expenditures to get. And seeing how the core can never quite figure that out and they had a lot of money to spend, I don't think we're the best we can ever hope is either a straight line or a lump sum somewhere. Thank you. I'm not sure I agree with that. I, uh, somebody is managing those contracts, and it's just a matter of maybe finance is the facilitator for helping them and raising the flags, but whoever is responsible should be managing that. Uh, there's outside forces involving uh, expenditures, so it's, it's, it's a wag. And some of those things are easier to predict than others, like yeah. personnel costs should be pretty easy to Stable. do, but capital outlay is a tough one. Mm -hmm. But what, you, what happens is, of course, department managers, you're aware of being in government that um, they get toward the end of the fiscal year and they don't want to leave money on the table. Uh, so, you know, if they need some supplies. They don't want to uh, burden next year's budget if they think they have money this year. And if, if they don't, if they're, if they're not given the right numbers toward the end of the year, they could conceivably overspend accidentally and that's just really the line of my inquiry. It, 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 could that have happened? The, the way I handled that situation was we had a priority list of, okay, how much money do we have that available for that year, and what priorities do we have? And you go A, B, C, D until you, you get to the bottom there, and then you spend the money on those priorities. And, and that way you, you always get what you need, and, and if you need more, you, know, you got to wait till the next year, but at least you always have an appropriate expenditure to use on it. Go ahead, Jen. If I could just you, John. clarify a little bit, if the two largest categories here that are over um, their appropriation amount, one of them has to do with a, a large transfer to the unfunded compensated absences um, that wasn't budgeted. So it wasn't so much that there was money left on the table that they felt they could spend, it just transferred into another fund. Um, and then the other one was related to uh, um, legal services for personnel-related matters. So again, not so much that they're trying to spend the money that they think mm -hmm. they might have, kind of unexpected, in the case of the legal services, you know, unexpected costs, and then the transfer from the general fund to the uncompensated absences fund. What happened with that compensated absences issue? What happened? Well, there, there was money that was transferred to, for compensated absences, liability. Mm -hmm. what, why did that happen? Why did it increase so much during the fiscal year? Uh, I know that the, they had a, they transferred $466,000 into the uncompensable, unfunded compensable leave fund, trying to start funding if you know, no one's at, not everyone's going to resign or leave at the same time. But as ev everybody builds sick leave and vacation time, there's payouts that have to be made at the time of termination. And uh, so I think the, the, there was a, a sentiment at that time that they wanted to start building a fund to be able to pay those out, you know, at, if, if, if we had a lot of retirements. And we did have a lot of retirements during 16, 17. At 12, 31, 16, we had 
eight or nine people retire because of retirement incentives. So out of that 466000 that was set over in that fund, I bet 236000 was paid out due to retirement incentives and vacation and sick leave and severances. Uh, so it, it didn't, it wasn't overspent. There's money still in the fund, but that's why it was, they wanted to take it out of the general fund and set it over in that separate fund. So it was sitting there. So it didn't look like the general fund had more money. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, say for when you, for, uh, for uh, you know a discretionary spending when you say they this was a council action this was a council action and it was resolution um, uh, seventy two dash sixteen on October twenty fifth two thousand sixteen. I remember Buckingham discussing this okay. at one point. Mm -hmm. It was up to six hundred k in that plus. Yeah. So it was that's they wanted to segregate it. Let me. I, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. One comment and then a question. Uh, the comment on this budgeting by month, I thought when John Martin asked the question last year, one of his first questions had to do with this monthly budgeting capability, and I thought we'd heard the software didn't have that ability. Whether it was or wasn't said then, we now understand it could be done. You have a few options, one of which is using the percentages of how it was spent the previous year, I guess you could overwrite that with what you think is going to happen, straight line or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do it. So then the issue gets into, is it worth it? But I'm, I'm hearing that you could do it. I'm not sure how many options you've got. Yeah, and I, um, can't, I can't sit here and say what the options are in the software. So it, it could be done whether or not, Jen, you think there's any value. I think you're basically saying the answer I've heard is there's not a lot of value to inputting that much detail. The next, the, which, whatever, you know, it, it is what it is. But it's just something to think about. But if that's not causing variance difference, then that's fine. My question, though, has to do with budget transfers. I'm personally a little skeptical. It's like rescheduling a project. You can always be on schedule if you keep changing things. I don't have a problem personally. We put a budget in place for the year, let it go. Uh, if you start making, if I understood what you meant by budget transfers, if you're saying, oh, we're overspending here and underspending here, so let's move some budget money, I personally don't think that's the way we ought to do it. You look at that at the end of the year and say, okay, we missed it. You want to manage to the bottom line, but as soon as you start, if what you meant to be saying is the example I just used, I would personally, again, be against it. I think we ought to just let it go. If you overrun something, you make a note saying we're overrunning it, and we're underrunning here, so we think we're going to be okay. But if, if hopefully that's not what you meant by a budget transfer, is to mask where we didn't estimate as well as we could have for whatever reason, things happen. So um, let's use the case of legal services. A department, something happens, and a department incurs more legal fees than expected. Um, there may be a situation where city manager, finance director, somebody says you need to absorb that in your in your budget. We're not giving you extra money for it. You need to figure out um, where you can pay from it for it from. The general philosophy would be for operating costs that are not personnel related. You can absorb it within your operating line items. We wouldn't generally do a transfer. Bottom line, you're good. You're good. In some cases, if it's a large dollar amount, departments have a really hard time knowing where they've taken their money from to help balance that out. So in order to help them do that, we would do a transfer. Not because we want to say, oh, we missed the mark and, and kind of cover it up, but just to help them track. I know I took $2,000 from my supplies line. I took 3000 from training materials. If a department's really struggling with trying to figure where they're going to balance that from, We'll do it for them on paper so they can see it. Um, we don't do transfers typically between departments. So public works can't borrow from fire. You know, it's all within your department, within your line items. I don't like to, we don't usually allow transfers for, from personnel related expenditure line items to operating um, unless it's a matter of we have a vacancy we can't fill so we're hiring a consultant to do that work. That would be okay but you, you don't use personnel savings for supplies and materials. 
um, we make that differentiation for the departments, or we are making that differentiation for the departments. And the, the reasoning is when you approve your budget, you approve a budget by department um, for personnel costs. So that is what you're saying for public works, it's $2 million for personnel costs. So they, they have to spend that on personnel related costs, or we have to come back to you, the council and ask for a budget adjustment. You used a very sensitive example of legal costs, as you know, um, which is maybe another discussion that, again, I'm hoping we're going to have a lot more visibility to legal costs. But it, I'd say that brings up a whole, opens up a whole can of worms to start talking about how some legal cost is causing possible some some of this issue we're talking about. So I don't want to get into that now, but that caused me a little alarm that legal cost. If legal cost is part of running the bar department, it ought to be there. Or we put legal cost as a line item, which is kind of where I'd like to have it go. Yeah. But So you're saying you don't, you definitely don't transfer between departments. Um, I guess between a contract and straight staff, you might say that would balance out. But again, let it go and just say at the end of the year, we overspent a contract because we got a contractor to do what we thought the labor was going to do. So. Okay, noted. Can we move on? Um, page 90, what's included in other revenues? That was another one that was a little off the mark, so I was just kind of curious. The uh, budget amount was 344, the final amount was 911,000. So there's a couple of items here. The 911, 911,000 includes the budget for our um, solar installation. When solar was installed on the um, city hall and I think the public works building, um, mm -hmm. that budget number is included in the 911. It's not included in the expenditure. Um, it oh, should have been okay. classified differently. Um, the other piece is there's 338 thousand dollars that's um, categorized as personal vacancy rate um, I can't tell you why that's listed as other revenue I would have thought it would have showed up as an offset to personnel costs in some way or another if it's a personnel vacancy rate uh, the what personal vacancy rate oh personnel, oh, personnel. okay all right I, I got it so somebody left and you didn't fill the position and right. okay so there's, gotcha. a, there's a vacancy factor that's built yeah. into the budget and the 338 was the vacancy factor okay, and for you just 16, pushed that 17. back in. Okay, that explains it. Thank you. Um, I also noticed on page 63 we had an asset called artwork valued at 63,000. I was just kind of curious where that artwork might be. Um, 60,000 is for the rock at Morro Bay Boulevard, oh. the stonework, I'm sorry, from okay. 2006, and then 3,000 for the art anchor structure that was done in 1996 down at Thailand's Park. Okay, that's very good, thank you. I'm just kind of curious, you know, look around here, I didn't see too much, so thank you. Um, and then that takes, let's see, I had a question on 143, why the big drop in the state water contract expense, 2.6 million, the previous fiscal year to 1.6 million. And that was on page, I think, 143 of the CAFR report. That would be about yes. a third of the way down. Yes, I see it. Um, yeah, it's just about midway through the page under operating expenses, mm -hmm. state water contract maintenance. Right. Um, the $1.6 million for 1617, uh, there was an $830,000 prepay. When we, of all the expenditures that we paid during the year uh, for state water, uh, 800 and, uh, let me get the right number, 803,000 was, pre, was prepaid for the next year for 1718. And so we, we accounted for it correctly in, in the 1617. And I, it was not accounted for, there was no prepaid uh, removed from the 1516 number of 2.6. And I'm not quite sure why they didn't identify that in the audit and correct that. You know, uh, maybe 
I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's why your number is lower in in sixteen seventeen is because okay. eight hundred three thousand was is prepaid for the okay. future year. We, so what do you think it's going to be next year? Then it go back up. Who knows? I have no yeah, okay. idea. But I, that prepaid will come back into expense in seventeen eighteen because mm -hmm. it'll be in the proper year. But every year there should, will probably be a prepaid because we pay that well in advance. Of they bill us well in advance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Public comment. Uh, opened maybe just add to the um, so we receive the bills for the entire year for the fixed costs at the beginning of the year right. and uh, prepay the next fiscal year at that time state water costs remain fairly constant um, there's a fixed portion and a maintenance portion the maintenance portion is the portion with an escalator on it uh, roughly, we've calculated about 5% per year that the state water will go up. But it's, a, it's running somewhere under about $2 million a year um, for our state water, project water. So you get it at the beginning of the calendar year is we what you're We get it at the beginning saying. of the calendar and year for... Prepay. Um, kind of like two payments. The, yeah. Uh, they bill on calendar year basis. Okay. We pay on fiscal year basis. Okay, okay. So, so if there, there's a fixed portion and a variable portion of the bill. Right. So why was there a variance between one year and the next? Because we prepaid the next year and noted it in the budget one year, and we didn't, we accrued all those costs, even the following year's cost, to that previous year. But, but if the bill's due in January? The bill is due in um, or December. January and July, and we typically get the bill in January, so we prepay so that it gets accounted for in that next fiscal year. So I'm still not understanding how, if you're paying in January of each year, which falls in the middle of the fiscal year, how does that become a prepay that's different from one year to the next? It seems, like, it seems like it would be the same every single year. It would be if it were accounted for a prepay in every single year. but. The previous fiscal year it wasn't accounted for as a prepay. I see. Okay. Th thanks. That's what she I'm, said. I'm, you I'm said sorry. You. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have on the CAFR. Any other questions, comments? Go ahead, John. Thank you. Uh, most of my stuff is in that introductory section, and page eight seems to have a lot of it. Uh, Long-term challenges, uh, first thing I ran to was second bullet, second sentence, and it said uh, something to the effect. Then funding in the amount of one point file would be needed for, to maintain. I would probably want to change that in future years when you write that up as estimated. Uh, as we go through this payment ma maintenance plan, as we find out what's actually out there, the numbers are going to squirm around a little bit. And hopefully we come up with some methods of repair which are considerably cheaper than this, the standard possibility. And, and Rob's quite were, well aware of um, what can change in those uh, payment man management program as we go along with it. Uh, another comment was um, we probably should have a section in uh, long-term challenges that um, one of the reasons why we're doing this wastewater re recycle facility is that uh, while the city has not kept up with its preventive maintenance on streets the state has not kept up with their preventive, preventive maintenance for the state water project which, based on what Rob has said, is it's, a, it's going to go up a lot. And that's one of the reasons why we've been doing this wastewater recycle facility, is have an option to, rather than just stay married to the state and pay whatever they tell us we have to pay, have an option to get out and, and control those costs better. Um, And that probably should be clear in the long-term challenges. Uh, another one which popped up was 
there probably should be a, a section of replacing the wastewater treatment facility, which is the other half of that uh, reason we're doing that uh, wastewater re re reclamation facility. Um, I'm sorry, John, where are you reading from? Huh? What page? Uh, in the introductory section. Roman numerals. Roman numeral Roman. eight. Oh. Uh, under medium-term challenges, I keep hearing that we really don't have a capital replacement program. Uh, we probably ought to have some discussion about capital replacement in the uh, in introductory section. Uh, and then I had a couple more things which kind of popped up while I was doing it. Uh, when I used to do budgets and project management and things, there was a term we called a risk management plan, where it can vary from the back of a napkin to way too much detail. And where, but you go through and you say, these are the risks that we're we're dealing. This is why we have this much contingency. Uh, that might be something the city could use to, you know, say this is why we have this much contingency. And you can base it on this risk management plan and it and whatever appropriate deal to detail to it, but there is a way to justify contingencies that we have. Um, and then the other thing, which uh, okay, and then the last thing which popped in my head, it'd be interesting to see what the negotiated scope for the auditors were, but I don't know if you'll be ever 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 be able to share that with us. But thank you. That's all I had. Okay. I think those are great recommendations that we can um, incorporate into the next transmittal. So thank you for those. Um, the, you're certainly, the contract with the audit firm is a public document. You're certainly welcome to look at that at any time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, John. Okay, so any further questions or comments on the CAFR report? Go ahead, Dave. I had a question, comment on uh, finding 217-003, which is the internal control over the recording of expenditures made subsequent to year end. It includes more than that, though. Um, the question I have is, what, what, what's the city's policy regarding the, the fiscal year end cutoff for expenditures charged to that fiscal year? So to the extent possible, um, you know, we wait until September-ish and we try to get any late invoices that have come in and we accrue them back to the prior year. I'll ask Sandy to speak specifically to the direction that went out at the time. Um, I think that came from either her or Craig and they gave some specific instruction um, to the departments on what should be accrued back and, and what should go into the fiscal year that they were currently working in. As I mentioned, one of the problems was that staff caught, I think, three of the five um, in their review and we thought it, they thought they had fixed it, but they didn't match the batch number in our system to the GL number, so it didn't actually get fixed. So that was just a, a learning opportunity, but I'll let Sandy speak to the direction they gave at the time. Yeah, there was a comprehensive memo that goes out at the end of every year talking, uh, giving direction to staff and directors as to what to watch for in invoices that come in at the end of the year. And uh, there's a lot of variables uh, as to what gets accrued. And an example would be if you're ordering supplies and you ordered it on June 29th, but you didn't receive it till September or July 15th, we would not accrue that because it wasn't received. But if the invoice, but if it was received on June 30, but you didn't get invoiced till September 14th, we would, we have to look at the date received. So there's a lot of detail that has to go into making sure you put the right expenditure in the right year. So those kinds of parameters uh, are explained and outlined and detailed in that memo. Uh, we ask them to also contact their vendors and ask them to accelerate getting their invoices in. We do leave it open. We leave it open as long as we possibly can. Usually 
into mid as open as we can until we have to send a trial balance to the auditors. We do have to cut off about mid September, close everything out so that we can get started on the audit. Uh, but there is quite a detail. I don't. I can't recall every detail, but I can certainly provide that memo to the committee so they can see the instructions that are given. Um, the uh, there's a lot of invoices that come through. You know. You know that we process uh, on a routine basis, and uh, it just so happened that there was five invoices that had were larger amounts. They were a lot of them were project related. They weren't operating expense related, um, and you know people just didn't notice that the that the services were rendered in the period you know, prior to the fiscal year closing because they were looking at the invoice date. So that's the that's the education we have to do with our, our staff and our directors. And also, it was a learning curve on the software system because some of them were identified, thought they put it in the batch dated June 30th, but the general ledger date was still July 27th, and so it got posted in the new fiscal year. So um, that, you know, that was a learning curve on our part. Yeah. So it would appear that your suppliers have to comply with revenue recognition rulings and that your expense recognition would be consistent with those in general. Would, would that be a fair statement? They can't be recognizing revenue and you're, you know, foregoing the pushing the expense out to another period. Correct, because if they shipped it and it, it was received, yeah. they obviously would recognize it as revenue. We need to recognize it as an expense. Okay. So it can get a little, you know, there's a right. lot of variables and there's a lot of different rules and people that aren't doing this all the time. If we closed the books and went on an accrual basis at the end of every month, it would give people 12, 11 different times cutoffs to practice this. Mm -hmm. We only do this once a year. So it's pretty, you know, we, we understand it, mm -hmm. but it's kind of hard, you know, when we have a decentralized AP process to really you help people be comfortable with that. I think that memo might be nice. You could just include it in a future agenda as a receiver sure. file. Sure. Sure. Would that, would that be okay? Because it, it certainly was outlined, and we tried to give them guidance. Okay. Thank you. So, so as I understand it, what you're, the policy is that if the if the goods are received or the service is rendered prior to June 30th, then that the invoice for those goods or that service will be paid from that fiscal year. That, the, That's correct. And mm -hmm. you're holding the fiscal year close open until mid-September. Yes. Okay. Yes, to try to you know allow for people to you know get their invoices in you know that are later. We also had a retention amount on the uh, pavement management. They didn't invoice. No, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It wasn't. It was on a storm drain replacement. There was a retention, and they invoiced us in. In August, we didn't. Our we had an engineer retire. I think at the end of the last fiscal year, and no, Public Works didn't realize that project was deemed complete, and so because we didn't know it was deemed complete, we accrued. You know, we left it in the 17, 18 year, but the auditors found it, and we had to accrue it back. And that was fifty three thousand of the two hundred adjustment. Okay. So, and then the comment I would make is that. Um, uh, in the management response, and it looks like there's an incomplete sentence there. The second sentence, as part of the organization's effort at stabilizing the staffing and structure within the finance department, comma, an assessment of centralizing the accounts payable function within finance. That doesn't quite make sense. On what page? This is on page, come on, wake up. This is on. This is. I'm looking at the staff report. I'm looking at the staff report, and it's um, page ten. Thank you. On the staff report, and this is under the the management response to the recommendation on 217-003. So that second sentence doesn't look like a complete sentence. But what I'm getting out of this is that finance is considering centralizing the accounts payable function back into finance, the finance department. Right now it's decentralized out to the various departments, so they are actually performing their own accounts payable functions against their contracts. Am I understanding that correctly? Are they, are they like issuing checks and? No, they don't issue the checks. They code everything and enter it into AP, and then it's okay. reviewed in finance um, so that what we're thinking about doing is just having, we'd send the invoices to the department for approval because that still needs to happen at the departmental level, um, but we would enter them in finance and then 
process from that point forward. Um, that would be more the centralized model. Instead of having departments entering them and then us reviewing what they've entered, we would just enter them. Would there also be some review of the, of the contract and if the, and to determine if the contract is actually open and if it has current certificates of insurance and endorsements and that, uh, uh, that the expenditure is appropriate to the contract and proper account numbers being charged and so on? So once the PO system is updated, all of that would be in a PO or attached to a PO. So if you had an approved PO um, with an outstanding balance that has been encumbered, you would know that that's all current. Um, but yes, at some, if we bring AP back in, we need to be able to check you know, contracts and all of that and make sure that the work meets the contract terms, there's a balance left on the contract, they have a business license, all those checks and balances. Before the check is actually released so Correct. that that can get corrected. Correct. Because um, I know that's from my past experience, that's one of the, one of the uh, m many of the things that happen with contracts is insurance certificates expire. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes contracts expire. So I, it sounds like the plan is you're gonna have a purchase order covering a long form contract is that is that am i understanding that correctly i would say that's my vision right now is some to uh, to the extent that we can get all of that tied into an approved po that would be the most efficient way of knowing when the invoice comes in that all those criteria are met right so the contract was if it needs to go to council it was approved at the council level they have a business license, their certificate of insurance is valid, all that's been submitted. It's held somewhere, and whether that's the finance department, the clerk's office, or where that will be, we need to determine. It should all be attached into electronically and hopefully with the PO system, and I think our system can, can accommodate that, that through LaserFish, it's all right there. Um, whoever's processing AP can click on it, confirm that if they, are you know, concerned that the contract period might have ended or something. But yeah, the idea is for all to be linked through that PO system to the extent that we can. So currently the, the contracts are essentially paper contracts. They're paper files that are being held by the departments. Um, the clerk is holding the more current ones. They used to be held at the department, so there's a little bit of a mix right now, but I think the clerk has the most of them, most of them at this point. Is that because the clerk's in charge of public records, or is there a reason for that? For that, having the city clerk, the city clerk. Well, I assume by clerk you mean you mean the city clerk. City clerk, yeah. I'll, I'll speculate that it was more efficient to have one common holding place for them, so you could okay. go to one person and pull a contract, rather than each individual department. Okay. Okay, so the the purpose of putting of, of covering that contract with the PO is to get it is to get it in the electronic database for the PO system, so it, it's it's more searchable, easier to locate, and so on. Right. I mean, you still probably I'm not sure if our records retention policy covers electronic storage at this point, so we may need to update that. So there might still be some paper copies, but from our perspective, I would have everything scanned into Laserfish so it was right there for us to access. Okay. All right. Well, I I, I would encourage you to, to centralize the uh, the AP function into finance for sure, and provide some checks and balances on the payments before they actually go out against contracts. Just to clarify, I don't want to give the impression that there's a none right now because we are reviewing it, but we're obviously missing things. So, um, you know, we have some checks and balances now. I think we're you know doing as good as we can do with the structure we have, but we might be able to be creative in how we redo our structure, so. I just wanted to add that I do do that step on all war, uh, wastewater treatment, the new wastewater treatment related co contracts. I go make sure that there's a, an approved contract, that they're within the limits, and there is an insurance policy on, in place, but that's the, the rest of them are done at the director levels at the, in their departments. Well, I think the, the key point there is checks and balances, and having mm -hmm. finance being the, the check and balance before that payment actually goes out, I think is important. 
Okay, well noted, and we may need to discuss that at a future. I want to get through all the agenda. I'm sorry, did you have some? Yeah, I had one. Uh, based on what David's talking about, it sounds like, is there anything that looks like a contracting officer for the city? We is there any person who looks like a contracting officer for the city, or is it spread between the various uh, departments with... It's spread between the departments. The departments are responsible for processing their own contracts at this point, and then they get sent to the clerk's office to be held in that filing cabinet. And who makes sure that uh, state requirements for contracts are met? Is the department, and then it's reviewed by somebody in the city, or is it? We have a standard kind of contract template that we use, but the city attorney signs off on the contracts as approved to form. You know, public Works is responsible for filing the DIR or making sure that the, you know, if it's a public works contract that the um, contractor has their DIR number and the departments are all responsible for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. Anything else before we move on to B3, Measure Q? All right. So let's move yeah, on. I, I oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. Jennifer, last year in the uh, the CAF or the the auditor made a couple of comments in its letter, which uh, we had mentioned in our memo to the uh, to the council, and I just want to read you a couple of them. The, it, the first one had to do with the uh, the coverage ratio for the state water payments, and it said that the city's ratio was at 116 percent, which is below the required minimum minimum ratio of 125 percent. And we had mentioned in our memo that we thought that was something that was uh, worthy of being uh, mentioned somewhere in the audit, maybe in the supplementary information. But it's something that really is a uh, something I think that should be um, revealed to the city council every year. And this year's CAFR doesn't mention it at all. So I'm, I'm assuming there was an improvement because of the water rate increase, but uh, as far as I know, uh, it's not mentioned anywhere. And then the second thing that they mentioned is that they said the uh, city's governmental activities and the Harbor Enterprise Fund had unrestricted net position deficits of 5.7 million and 0.6 million or 608,000 respectively management's plans regarding those matters are described in the management discussion and analysis. And we looked for that, and of course, there wasn't any mention of that in the MDNA, and we, so we pointed that out. But I would just mention that this year, um, both of those deficits have deteriorated further. The um, governmental activities has gone uh, down by an additional roughly 400,000. And the uh, harbor, uh, the uh, unrestricted net position in the harbor um, enterprise fund is $989,000 compared to 608 last year. And if you look in the auditor's letter this year in the CAFR, uh, those things aren't mentioned at all. So I'm, I'm curious as to if those were worthy of being mentioned last year by the auditor, why weren't they mentioned this year? And is that something that management actually asked them to remove? I certainly didn't ask them to remove. Um, quite frankly, we wouldn't have had time to ask them to remove anything because we were writing this as they were compiling these. So we were writing our piece. I mean, that, that wouldn't have even been an option, nor would we do that anyways. But. Um, I don't know specifically why they choose to mention some items one year or another. I can't really ask that. What we can do is um, bring back when this goes to council and the, and the council memo, it's scheduled for April 10th. I'm happy to include the um, coverage ratio for state water and we can talk about the deficits, um, talk about those points specifically um, from staff's perspective. Okay, thank you, John. I thought I saw those percents in there somewhere. The I did. I, 123 or something? I, I could have sworn I saw it, but I don't know. It might it, have been buried in, in a in footnote. Note, in some notes somewhere, but I can't remember where yeah. I saw it. It said I thought it was in we there. were required to have 1.25% uh, one, one 
times the, uh, the exposure for the state water project. And I think wherever the discussion of the state water project is where we're going to find that. Uh, yeah, maybe. Okay, anyways, uh, moving right along, that'll take a, are we, if we are finished, we'll go on to measure Q, which is item B3. And thank you, Jennifer, for that information. Um, so, I'll open it up for public comment. Is there any public comment on item B3, measure Q funding for the fiscal, current fiscal year, 2018 to 19? All right, seeing none, close and bring it back to um, the committee for discussion. If I could just Go ahead. add a little bit. Um, this is new this year. This is kind of a new step in the budget process. I don't think we've come to you in the past and asked for um, kind of your, your thoughts prior to giving you a proposed budget. Um, part of this is just kind of our new budget approach and then the other part of it is, is that you know, in light of the fact that the general fund is facing some pretty significant deficits and we're working towards how we're going to balance that, um, there may be some options or some um, ability to kind of change some of the funding proposed in Measure Q. Um, the police chief has not had a chance to meet the committee since he's joined the city and we felt that it might be useful for the committee to hear from the three departments that are impacted by Measure Q, um, a kind of a discussion of what their, what their needs are, and then if the committee wants to give any feedback to us as staff as we go back and kind of get that in advance before we develop the proposed budget, um, keeping in mind and recognizing that, um, you know, it's advisory, so we'll certainly take it under advice. Um, and we want to collaborate with you to the extent that we can. So we thought that would be useful information to have. Um, but as we're developing the budget, you know, we'll, we'll certainly bring back what we think is the most um, appropriate budget for the committee to review in April at the next budget at the next committee meeting. So um, if it's okay, I'd like to ask the fire chief to start out, and then. Um, they just want to speak for a few minutes, each of them, on kind of the needs in their departments, and then maybe we can talk about what you would like to recommend going forward. Okay, thank you. We have been involved somewhat in the past with the A list and B list and that, so we appreciate that. Welcome, Chief Knuckles, and go hey, ahead. Hey, good afternoon, and uh, you know, we got a lot to celebrate. Measure Q has made a tremendous difference in the public safety component in our community. You know, it all started from the Emergency Services Ad Hoc Committee that started in 2003. Um, I served on that committee, and we came up with recommendations for revenue enhancements um, that we looked at from, from benefit assessment tax to um, all the way to sales tax. And uh, the council at the time voted for a sales tax initiative, and it's been very um, well received, and uh, what a positive difference it's made in our community. You know, the Emergency Services Ad Hoc Committee addressed four different areas in the fire department that was uh, that needed a lot of help. One is that we needed to be able to cover simultaneous calls. At that time, we, if a second call came in, we would have to res respond someone from home to come in and take that second call. We didn't have OSHA mandated staffing to make interior attacks on structure fires. Um, we had an aging fleet, and then our fire station was destroyed on Harbor Street, and we had to find a funding source to help us with that. So some statistics that the, uh, the celebration that we should have, um, especially on the fire side, that Measure Q has done its job, and it's done, and I hope in the future also. So since 2008, that's when we increased our staffing to cover simultaneous calls. We're able to respond to over 2,500 more calls in our city uh, when, they were, when 911 was dialed at the same time, and uh, that is is a big plus because uh, again if we had to wait for that second engine to come in from another city or people coming from home we're talking 25 30 minute response times and that is catastrophe uh, for medical aids and fires um, we were we had this since 2008 we had also the opportunity to make impressive interior attacks on 161 structure fires in our community also with Measure Q and the Hogue Foundation and Bertha Schultz, uh, they all helped us get our fleet back up to where it needs to be. Um, also with the help of Measure Q, Cal OES, and Fire Act grant, our community was able to replace our damaged Harbor Street Fire Station um, right down in downtown Morro Bay. 
and uh, also with uh, um, with the help of Measure Q and other grant funds that we have, uh, the community was able to replace needed medical rescue and firefighter equipment um, that we that the general fund sometimes can't uh, uh, support, but it also enhances our service to our citizens. So some of the sample items that uh, we have uh, requested and have received funds since 2007 uh, definitely is the fire building of the fire station 53 on Harbor Street, uh, but also to help us with the debt service that we're making right now. Um, the salaries and benefits to maintain four-person staffing, um, as we do now. We have a very creative staffing pattern. We use part-time help. Basically, we have 12 slots, 11 full-timers. We use part-time help and overtime to fill that 12th spot, vacation time, holiday time. Um, and by some creative uh, scheduling, it's been turned out to be the most cost-efficient way of doing it. Um, it's helped us with fire hose replacement, uh, generator for our MASH casualty trailer, for which staffs uh, medical equipment for 48 patients. Has helped us with uh, repairing our Black Hill repeater, a comprehensive rewrite of our Morro Bay Emergency Management Plan, which we're doing right now at this time. Has helped us with uh, heavy rescue hydraulic equipment, um, a sustainable fuel for fire apparatus and rescue apparatus at Station 53. It's helped us establish our moral command frequency for our EOC, fire department, and harbor department, and also Coast Guard functions. Uh, helped us with self-contained breathing apparatus tester. It's called a port account, so that we can test our equipment yearly without sending our equipment off. It is a cost savings measure. It's helped us with, this, uh, with our mobile data terminals. It's helped us replace command vehicle. Uh, helped us purchase a Type 1 Pierce engine. Um, at that time, what we did is we paid into a fund until we raised enough money, then we replaced that apparatus. It's also helped us maintain our apparatus schedule along with the Hogue grant to replace our squad um, and uh, also helped us purchase an additional uh, Type 1 engine um, that uh, we used a depreciation account that was established by Measure Q. So next year, um, we're looking into things that uh, uh, it's really no different than the past requests that we have done. One is, again, to pay, help pay for the debt service that we have for the station. Also to help us with uh, salary and benefits with uh, part-time and full-time help to maintain our four-person staffing. Um, also to uh, look at, uh, we just did a study on our single repeater site for emergency uh, frequencies, and we only have one on Black Hill. We used to have two, um, but the second one was at a private location at a cell site. We're, we're losing the fight on that hill, so we're not, we're down to one. So we, are, we did some studies, and we found that uh, we can place a second repeater with good coverage in our city at our fire station, which is our secondary dispatch in case of an emergency event. We also have ham radios there also. And then um, the fourth request is to uh, go into a five-year payment plan for replacement of 5391. It is a 25-year-old engine. It's done a great service for the city of Morro Bay. Uh, we do have a remaining about $250,000 from the Schultz um, Trust that we use for a down payment to bring the payments down to a five-year payment schedule. Um, so those are basically the four things that we're going to be looking at at the fire department to request out of Measure Q, and I'm open to any questions. Um, thank you. I have some questions. If uh, uh, Thank you for the report. <clears throat> Excuse me, the report. That was excellent. Um, and also for what was included in the agenda packet. And um, I was noting on the budgets versus incidents, cost per incident, um, Morro Bay looked like had the low, almost the lowest cost. Uh, budget versus incident of 1,442. So specific, was that that good last year? And specifically, what do you attribute that to? Is that the training or what? Well, one is our creative scheduling. Um, there's only, okay. uh, at this time, we're switching over a database that uh, fire departments use nationwide. Okay. There's only two fire departments that use our type of scheduling, and that is us and South Bay. And uh, okay. so they're changing their database just to fit us. So. Uh, mm -hmm. With the use of part-time help and still trying to maintain our reserve component, that's mm -hmm. helping us a lot. And also, we've been extremely successful with grants and givings, and I think that is probably a big mm -hmm. factor also. Um, we probably 50% of our equipment and capital replacement off our schedule is we get off grants or trusts or Measure Q. Um, mm -hmm. That has been the greatest success, I think, also. Mm -hmm. So I think with the creative uh, scheduling and also uh, uh, being very successful in grants and givings. 
But the grants would still be included in the calculation, right? Or are these calculations only what comes out of the fire department? It's expenses. So those are expenses, expenses that yeah. come out of the general fund. General fund. Yeah. Uh, and oh, measure Q. They only come from and, and measure, measure Q. Q. Right. So, so it still shows a very efficiently run. That, that's what I think this indicates. And that shows right there that, yeah, you have a very efficient run fire department for the cost. Right, right. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, the other thing I... I question the residents versus non-residents incidents and it looked like two-fifths of them based on what you know were non-residents yes so 40 percent roughly if we can extrapolate to the unknown calls are coming from people that are not residents is that what are they doing? That's, so right now, what are our tourists doing that are ca causing all these calls? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do get a lot of visitors. You know, our population, mm -hmm. if you look at our cost per population, we're off the chart. Mm -hmm. So we just can't go off what the population sign says um, on yeah. the city limits. We do get a lot of visitors. You know, I've heard mm -hmm. sometimes between three quarter to a million visitors every year mm -hmm. we get. Um, in the past, because we right now we have a pretty clunky database, we're switching over in April. Mm -hmm. We had to do it manually, and right now we are going through and manually checking the reports: who lives out of town, who's unknown, and who does live in town. Mm -hmm. In the past, it's been roughly about 31 percent we can confirm they're from non-residents in our community. And they're they're calling. They're calling 911. So will they get oh, in car okay. accidents okay. or they have medical aids on? It's the not just there. fires in the motel room. It's yeah. Okay. No, no, a lot of medical uh, aid. A lot of medical, medical aid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, comments, questions, members. I have a question. Can you explain your plan for the five-year replacement of the fire engine? Oh, you bet. Our plan is to first start off with a $250,000 down payment. And uh, we probably, uh, I will be going to the council for a single source request. We purchase Pierce engines, uh, which are the best in the, in the country, because we need our engines to last 20 to 25 years. Most cities, they replace their engines at 20 years. Uh, we pushed ours to 25 years because they're a good quality uh, piece of apparatus. Um, um, and then they'll be going into a five-year payment schedule. So we'll be looking at uh, um, definitely working with finance and looking at all our options. But uh, usually of Pierce Industries, they do have the lowest interest rates and best terms for us for uh, purchasing an apparatus. Purchase, not a lease, correct? That's correct. Yeah, can you explain to us this chart uh, in regards to the Morro Bay ISO rating and fire insurance? I, that that one boggled my mind. Well, sorry, we'd, uh, we don't have any, I didn't get any written explanation on that. I do apologize for that. So what we have been told uh, by, the in, by the industry insurance brokers that there is 5 to 6 percent reduction in fire insurance between 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. There is a 4 to 5 percent reduction in residential fire insurances between 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Everything above a 5 usually doubles. In today's time, especially what occurred up in Santa Rosa and the Thomas Fire in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County, they may not even cover your, uh, your facility. Um, we went down from a five to a three about two and a half years ago, and the factors that got us down to a three was getting our fire ladder truck back in service from, thank you, Bertha Schultz. Also switching over to our dispatch, which gives us three different methods of being dispatched, and they have multiple dispatchers in their dispatch center. That lowered our number. We've got a great water system, we've got great testing, and we also have uh, um, great maintenance. Um, so we score very high in our water maintenance, our water portion of it, and our fire training. Also, we do get a lot of uh, uh, points for our fire training in addition. So right now we're at three. Um, and uh, so if we were to, for example, let's say um, uh, we make a decision to, to decrease our staffing again and go back to a five, there can be a 10 percent increase on fire insurance. Um, if we went past a five, uh, there's a chance that we won't be able to insure some of the buildings in our community. Okay. And I have a question for Jennifer related to the fire. Um, basically, you know, the coral property that was sold in an escrow and is going to be used to pay down the debt that he's referring to, the 15-year, we're probably in year two or three. Um, I, I understood there was stipulations in that escrow 
about subdividing or whatever, is that sale finalized? The proceeds are supposed to go to pay down that debt. Um, it, it's still an escrow at this point. I think it was a 36-month escrow, if I remember. 36 months? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. If I remember correctly. It was a very long escrow period. So oh, okay. It's, so it's still an escrow. We don't have... That affects, you know, obviously, right. funding for what you're asking for. So, right. Okay. Thank you. I have a quick... Go ahead. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the creative scheduling and the part-time person or the part-time people and how you keep consistency of practice if there's um, firemen or fire people, you know, rotating in and out on a part-time basis to control cost, which obviously we appreciate, or I do from a Measure Q perspective on the cost side, but then I'm wondering how you uh, keep that going if there's rotating personnel that aren't a consistent part of the department, or maybe they are? So we do have a reserve component. Uh, right now we do have 15 members. I do have four of them right now down in Lompoc, finishing their living down there, uh, finishing the academy, fire academy, the full-time fire academy. It is a challenge. I mean, uh, as you probably have been hearing, what's been going on with uh, uh, Pismo Beach recently, getting rid of their uh, fire uh, reserve program. Uh, five Cities Fire Authority being very challenged. You know, today's society doesn't really support, um, like when I started, it was like the Lions Club. It was doing community service. Well, today it's the apprentice program, and, and especially how Cal OSHA has required now hundreds of hours for each of our reserves to train. We do have to look at the cost-benefit line every year, and uh, we have do that every year to tr try to come up with a... Um, creative scheduling to get them in there. You know, by contract with the full-time staff with the MOU, basically I can run three full-time and one trained qualified reserve. Now, that qualified trained reserve may only have 10% of the training of the full-time, but that's something we tolerate right now. And uh, my job in the next few years is trying to maintain our reserve component. Uh, there are times where I may not be able to get a reserve or uh, one of the other full-timers are off um, that I do have to use my overtime budget, which is calculated, uh, to help fill and make sure I maintain 4-0 staffing. Uh, since 2008, when we started this, we have maintained our 4-0 staffing. Uh, the only exception is like if we had a uh, significant event in our area and we were spending mutual aid, we may be down staff just for 30 minutes or so, um, but uh, we have maintained our staffing since 2008 um, um, all the time. And then do you, with the purse piece, I don't know how that affects, I'm assuming there's a big effect um, or significant effect. Do you expect staffing to stay level? Well, do you expect to see changes, more, more part-time people? I don't think I'm going to be able to get more part-time people, to be honest. Uh, right now, we, have, uh, we are very grateful that we have 15 folks. Uh, we are constant. We usually hire six a year, but we lose six or seven a year. So it's kind of an up and down peaks and valley. The average lifespan of a reserve is about two and a half years. So uh, um, on the reserve component, uh, I'll let uh, Jennifer talk about the PERS. Uh, we may have to address that in the future. But uh, uh, we're looking at the reserve program now to keep the hours down so that we can keep uh, um, them out of the PERS range. Jennifer. So PERS is going to play a big impact, you know, for fire and, and all our departments, really. And we're looking right now at um, the, the city has an, an, ex, an exemption under PERS for some of our part-time, all of our part-time employees. Um, but that's, PERS is revisiting that. So um, HR and um, Dana and Lori and have been having conversation with PERS and with our legal team and finance is getting involved as we need to sort out classifications that are no longer exempt from PERS, even if they're part-time. Um, so, and budget those numbers too. And that's the other thing is the, the PARS, which was what part-timers were put into. Um, it's a small amount, but we weren't really budgeting for that. So those are kind of conversations we're having right now, just yesterday actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for Chief Knuckles? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, the Chief Allen is going to speak a little bit, too, about the police. Okay. Needs. Welcome. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, thanks. Good. Appreciate this opportunity to address you. And I just wanted to give some thoughts about our police safety and um, 
the challenges that come with keeping our community safe. So our crime prevention, our proactive, proactive community policing, and all of these things that, that we really uh, enjoy in our city are due largely in part to the very hard work of the police officers behind the scenes. In spite of our staffing issues, uh, it is that proactive police work late at night, early in the morning that keeps our community safe and addresses many of the issues before they occur. In 2006, we had 26 sworn authorized on our police department. In 2017, we had 18, and I am currently down one position. I have 17 sworn officers, including myself and the commander. Uh, the concerns and the challenges that come uh, with these staffing levels uh, are, um, are many. It's very important for me and for us uh, to ensure that we have a police staffing level that adequately can protect and serve this community. Our staffing realities now are that oftentimes on, a, on any given shift, we may have one sergeant, two officers. Um, that is greatly impacted if we have an arrest of a homeless person as we are addressing the quality of life issues and that homeless individual uh, before they, they're taken to jail, uh, require med medical att attention. So it is very, very conceivable and often happens that if we have a person like this arrested, that officer is gone and out of the city for three to five hours sometimes as they're getting medically screened to get booked. Uh, when you uh, add to that the other issues that may arise and the fact that our surrounding law enforcement partners are likely challenged. For instance, the Sheriff's Department has two deputies on duty from Cambria down south to um, wherever they go down south. I forget the boundary there. So, so my point is uh, that many, many times we're left in our, our city with one, maybe two officers at best. Um, patrolling and protecting our citizens and responding to calls for service. Uh, despite that, we'll continue uh, to be creative. Some of our uh, strategies are uh, forming community partnerships, community education, neighborhood watches, uh, training is huge. Uh, I know I don't need to remind anybody of uh, the recent tragedies that have occurred um, nationwide in our schools. Um, as early as today, Paso Robles High School was, uh, was on lockdown. That has now been lifted. And uh, of course, we had the other incident uh, this morning in the school. The point here is that uh, we'll continue to uh, do the best we can with the resources provided. Um, I want to underscore the importance of the school resource officer, and I know for fiscal reasons that uh, that could not continue, and I understand that. Uh, but at some point, we have to uh, come to an understanding of how low do we allow our staffing level to get, uh, and I need and ask for your ability to provide the adequate staffing that can protect our community effectively. I'll take any questions you have. Actually, I, I do have one question in the material provided. Thank you. There were some police performance indicators and measures. It looked like it was just a template. Is that correct? And are you tracking some of these metrics or going to? And it looked like even more importantly, you had a you will have a budget associated with each you know, like a courtesy citation issue, how many, and then I assume there'd be a cost associated with each of that. Is that what this template was for? Um, so it, it, we're crossing over a little bit into B4 because that was really kind of the discussion oh, okay. for B4. Okay. Okay. Um, and those are templates. Okay. Um, they're more metrics that we're asking the departments to come up with with what 
kind of what their workload is so oh, that okay. we can so try can to kind of measure it yeah budget to I think that's great if they can provide those yeah. easily without you know tracking it on us and, and sticky also to clarify those are really in draft form so they're conceptual at this okay. point and there there may change when you get your actual budget document but we wanted to give the committee a okay. chance to see where we're going okay uh, questions for chief Allen I, you know, I, I think it was last meeting I had asked staff if there's a way to get um, a comparison of cost without the SRO, since this committee voted, you know, to, to move that money around and to see if we actually are saving money by defunding that position or if that money is now being spent by servicing the schools or servicing the school age population, but just by different officers. So if there's a way to find out, is it truly a cost savings or is that money just sort of you know, being spent with, by other officers for overtime or for doing those same amounts of services or for um, addressing crime in other ways that could have been addressed by the SRO, if that makes sense. I'd like uh, Jennifer to respond to that particular part and then I'll pick up on the... Okay. Yeah, so um, that was the discussion at the last council uh, or last committee mm -hmm. meeting. Um, and I think we talked about the 70,000 that was set aside in Measure Q. You know, it's truly a cost savings, except for we reallocated most of that to purchase fire equipment. But truly a, a cost savings. Um, if so we brought that kind of circled around to maybe there was some calls for service metrics out to the school or something that we could we could speak to. And we had some conversations. Maybe the, the chief can address how often they get called out to the school and existing staff are responding to that. Right, and to be sure, in, in response to your question, um, that's a difficult one. However, the reality is that uh, I can't really afford a school resource officer because we have to, we're down to bare minimums in terms of our deployment of our officers. So that officer that was previously in the SRO program is was uh, reassigned back to patrol. And I am down one officer because we had an officer earlier uh, in June that did not make probation. So in reality, um, that analysis and, and, and those impacts of, of cost savings, uh, uh, we don't have the position, we don't have the funding. So we're, we, res we uh, respond to calls at the schools, work with the school administration uh, as we can. We're planning active shooter training and uh, school safety programs and all of those things, but we do not have a presence on the school campuses. And I think in our discussion, just to uh, reiterate, we were all supportive of the SRO at the previous contribution rates. What the concern was, was the school was no longer funding their portion, and we felt we couldn't double the contribution with all the other challenges. So I think it, it I really appreciate this information you gave us, and we can look over it prior to the meeting. We're supportive. It's can we take on someone else's uh, contribution? Yeah, I would just like to add to that, that um, uh, with respect to San Luis Coastal Unified School District, that while the students are on school property, they, the students are entrusted to their care and they need to demonstrate some willingness to, you know, to, to contribute to, the, uh, to a school resource officer. And I asked the chief before we, we met today, uh, do we really know, I've never looked at the, the school district budget, to know to what extent the school district is funding a school resource officer at San Luis High or at Los Osos Middle School, in which case that would be the Sheriff's Department. Uh, that would help offer some context to us as to whether, you know, it's neither here nor there right now because we've elected to not fund, you know, to not uh, uh, fund 100%. We want, we want to see the district come up with 50%, but I'm wondering if they're coming up with 50% in San Luis Obispo or coming up with 50% over at Los Osos Middle School. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, you know, before we, we should, you know, even consider going back to 50%, we, should, we have to consider two things. First of all, the students are entrusted to the care of the district while they're on the school property. And second, what are they doing in those other two schools? 
So I, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I just, but I, I do want to offer some perspective there. And if I may, just in it, just very quickly, I want to compliment you, Chief, uh, for what your department is doing under some really challenging circumstances. Every interaction I've had with uh, your officers has been has been positive, has been constructive. Uh, in the last two days, just in my neighborhood, I've noticed a, a, just officers doing their work and and of a preventative, proactive nature, uh, noticing that there's a, um, there was a, a, a gate off the hinge and, and, and kind of looked like it could have been a break-in. Today, there was an officer got out of his car and was checking a car that was parked all along the side of the road uh, in, you know, kind of blocking traffic in an awkward way and trying to determine, well, what the heck is that car doing there? So, I mean, they're out there, they're doing their jobs, and uh, you're to be complimented for it because they're, they're so conscientious. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I did want to add uh, some context to the school resource officer position, and we talked about measures. How do you measure the effectiveness? Having been a former uh, DARE officer in Los Angeles, and you all remember that program, so many of those measures of effectiveness uh, are, are difficult sometimes to quantify because the reality is the, 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 the connections that the officers make the intervention with parents and, and school officials, the recognizing issues before they become problems, those things are very, very difficult to quantify when you talk about the benefits of a program like this. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to add that context and, and perspective. And uh, the school resource officer is a great program, obviously one that I would like to have. My reality is that uh, I'm down an officer, so I need kind of all hands on deck, uh, and that's where I'm at now. Thank you for your time. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. Two question comments, and you've got an uh, advisor over here for my second one. Uh, I would like to put uh, the concern here as a question. Do you know how the SROs are funded, at least in San Luis Obispo County? I mean, the example today was, it, fortunately, there was <laughs> the SRO was a SWAT guy, so he was able to pretty effective, but right. if you could find out in, gen in just San Luis Obispo County, it's not looked nationwide or even right. California, but if you could answer that question to the extent, quite frankly, that if in other schools, the city, like in San Luis Obispo, is the city funding the SRO or is the school district? You don't know, but if you could find out. The other issue, looking at your stats here, is the other sort of national hot button issue um, and that's narcotic offenses. And this is, again, like I said, you've got an, a, a chief uh, expert over here in the corner. Um, that was, if you look at the numbers here, that one is perceptibly up. Um, is that an anomaly, or is that just a nationwide trend that goes along with the opioid crisis? And opioids may be putting an umbrella over a lot of narcotic issues. Right. But is that what we're seeing here? Is this a reflection of the national trend? And, I don't know, and how would you respond to how that's going to impact? You talked about taking people in and losing four or five hours. Is that going to exacerbate going It, it will. This, this is an uphill battle that's being experienced nationwide. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, that particular problem uh, touches every age bracket. But certainly it, it has an impact in the schools. To your earlier uh, question about Paso Robles, they actually do not have uh, a, a school resource officer. They are reaching out to those of us who have or had school resource officers for information on, on, uh, on having one based on, uh, obviously, the re recent incidents. So there are some schools in the county that, that were, uh, as we were, uh, uh, the school resource officer went away, and then there are yet others that are trying to get school resource officers based on current events. I can tell you I was in a school district in the late 70s that had a SRO. It was a very effective. It was, he was only there half a day. He even taught a class. Right. And I did some research generally over this issue, and it appears to be in most cases it's 
funded jointly, but not all cases. There's some very affluent districts or where maybe the whole thing is funded by the county or the, you know, it was a little bit all over the map, but generally speaking, it was around the, from what I could gather, around the 50% you know, type thing, so. Uh, the other question would be maybe the school district could uh, be proactive and, and maybe look for some grants as as you've been successful in the fire and that and, and try to find some help that way if, if it's an issue. But I think, oh. go ahead, John. Well, I, all due respect, I don't think it's the job of this committee to play tit for tat with the school district. I think it's the job of this committee to be thinking about the safety or the finances, really our job is the finances, but the chief is here, so we happen to be talking safety, to be thinking about in the context of our city and not being, you know, I don't know that it's our job to say, well, we wanna know what the school district does before we'll do X. I would like us to be thinking about what's important for our city, and if without the SRO, if there's a rise in crime in that age level, or if there's less prevention with that age level, then we can be thinking about that in terms of what we control. We don't really have control of what the school district does. Um, it's my impression that being a government agency, the school district's budget would be accessible to the public. I don't, you know, so that's a piece of that. But I, I would just urge for us to be thinking about how can we have an effect with our own de police department as opposed to this back and forth. And, I, and the reason I bring it up now is we've had this conversation ongoing and it feels like, well, unless the school district does X, then we're not gonna do Y. And I'm not sure we should be operating from that point of view. I have a Noted. couple of Thank questions you. before the chief leaves. Go ahead. Um, you're, you're down an officer that didn't make probation. Do you have funding in the current year budget to replace that officer? Uh, no. Okay. How would you see Measure Q funds being able to help with your staffing problems? And has the police department considered starting a, like a reserve officer program where you have part-time officers available to, to supplement staffing? I'll answer your first question first about um, the, the Measure Q impact or potential impact. Um, there, there are many, many possibilities, of course, uh, but uh, in the future, perhaps in better uh, fiscal times, perhaps uh, Measure Q would consider uh, uh, financing an additional officer um, or two, dreaming. Uh, and, and then we would have the ability to, uh, to, to perhaps uh, put one in the school, but, but allowing us to get that second position back eventually would certainly impact our uh, ability to protect the community. But I really do have to uh, do kind of a first things first, back to basics mm -hmm. thing at this point. Um, your second uh, issue about reserve officers is, is uh, equally challenging for police and fire. And a little different for police though, because they have to, uh, maintain a certain level of training before their level line, line reserve officers, which would mean that they can go out and work alongside an officer and, and perform law enforcement duties. So uh, that's a very difficult challenge. I was a reserve coordinator for LAPD, and finding those people who would normally want to do that as a second career and then go back to what would amount to nine months training um, uh, kind of a prolonged six-month academy is a difficult challenge. Uh, and most people uh, who, who would do the reserve-type duty would, would now be this, those, those same uh, individuals who would get that training at Allen Han Hancock or another college academy and just become a police officer. So, and, and then you have to look at the, also the demographics. This is an older community, and it's harder to find somebody who may be a successful business person. But uh, you know, at some point, I always wanted to be a police officer and go back and commit that time. So it's difficult. Any other questions for? Thank you. Excellent Thank you. presentation. Thank you so really much. appreciate it. 
So the public works director is going to talk a little bit. There were some questions on some of the new pavement materials being used, um, and he can speak to that. I think it's important to clarify that, you know, as we're going into budget, we're really looking at there isn't there isn't adequate funding to add positions. There isn't adequate funding to add positions, to add new things. So um, th that's a challenge for all departments. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I feel the police department when they say they're down a position, but they, they have their funded positions filled, um, but they, they lost a person and that feels like a position. So it creates problems that would create problems in finance. You know, I completely am sympathetic to that. but. Um, realistically, for all the departments, I don't see a lot being added to the budget. Um, we're looking at how we can be creative with the money we have. So, um, Rob, if you want to talk about um, your pavement. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. Um, Rob Liva here to talk about... Uh, Trying not to get that ink spot in the shirt pocket, retract the pen, uh, not look like the typical engineer walking around with that ink spot there. Um, Measure Q is funded um, along with um, a couple other funding sources, about $6.7 million in um, street work over the past few years. Those other funding sources include our urban um, highway, uh, state highway account funds, a formula-based fund that's uh, delivered through SLOCOG, some excess general fund, um, our uh, grant funding, and then some competitive um, regional state highway account funds. Um, last year we reconstructed, or two years ago, reconstructed a portion of uh, South Bay Boulevard with that money. Over the past few years we've um, worked on approximately 25 of our 53 miles, center line miles of street and increase the PCI from, or pavement condition index from um, 63 to 66. Um, anything below 70, um, state considered that um, uh, pavement at risk. Um, the, um, the, the trend of, of um, our PCI would indicate that we could be at um, about a 56 average PCI um, citywide by 2026 if um, um, funding levels are not increased. Um, we have employed um, alternative techniques to um, um, street work. Um, I grew up in a world of uh, you um, thin overlays or for slurry seals every five years, um, thin overlays, um, overlays, grind um, or gut and reconstruct. Um, cost comparison, about $87 a yard to reconstruct a road um, in last year's dollars. Um, we pay between four and eight dollars a yard for these alternative sealing techniques that we use. I think you're buying us um, anywhere between two and ten years time frame on our streets. Um, I know many of you have heard this story before. Moro, most of Morro Bay streets were not built as streets. They evolved. Um, they were county dirt roads that became red rocked, that when upon incorporation were sealed and then an overlay happened, but the existing base of the road wasn't uh, built as a street. So I think we've made good use of the Measure Q money. We had a rough start to begin with. We didn't spend very much of it and then um, um, have been um, working to find the best expenditure plan. Um, but this isn't unique to Morro Bay. This is happening statewide and, and nationwide. We have an aging infrastructure that we haven't funded. Um, construction costs are rising. There's increased regulatory um, um, requirements. We have a reduced purchasing power due to increased construction costs. Um, 
everybody's budget's constrained. Um, and then you have the um, impact on the streets themselves. Um, increased traffic, um, heavier tra traffic. Um, we have higher um, um, fuel efficiency in our vehicles now. Um, and our street funding is um, typically based on the gas tax. Um, and we need to accommodate all the users. Um, you know, we're not just the, the car. It's um, pedestrians, bicycles, and buses. Now there's some bright spots with funding. Um, uh, last year the legislature and governor signed um, SB1, um, which added this year, um, Oh, it was a partial year, $61,000 to our um, pavement plan, and we got to do Andros and another uh, street uh, in North Morro Bay. Um, but uh, the first full year of funding will add um, in excess of $200,000, which um, typically we do about $500,000 for Measure Q, so I think it's a significant increase um, to the amount of, of paving. Um, we will continue to um, leverage um, the rubberized pavement grant, um, our um, urban state highway account, the formula-based money for maintenance, and um, continue to apply for any other available grant funding. Um, with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have or attempt to answer any questions you might have. Go ahead, John. Rob, do, do your crews do a lot of their own road maintenance or is it all pretty much contract work? So our crews can do um, patching, potholing, crack sealing, um, um, berm repair fairly well. Uh, when we go to street paving, we just don't have the equipment um, to pave an entire street. Um, we don't have a paver. Um, so we would need to hire a contractor with a paver, and not just a piece of equipment. We can go down to United and rent. Um, we do a um, halfway decent job with a um, Leighton box on the back of our uh, skip and drag uh, to um, when we tried to pave before, but it's still not the same thing as using a paving machine. And is that what the skid steer is used for? Skid steer is used for, um, it has a grinder on the front of it and a sweeper, so it's used for prep work ahead of any paving. Go ahead, John. I remember that we had a conversation about was there a possibility of sharing the ownership of a paver, and I think your response to that was there's some legal requir requirements which preclude us from sharing ownership of equipment, is that true? Um, I don't remember if that, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know that uh, we were going, we've talked to the county several times about sharing um, um, expertise in various areas where we might be able to uh, pothole and crack fill. They have actual paving equipment, so to, to um, um, share resources and contract internally for that uh, amount. Um, I used to work for a county in in Southwest Washington, and that was our standard practice, is um, the county was big enough that the smaller cities just contracted with us for their road maintenance operations. Our county has a multitude of road maintenance equipment and does quite a bit of their own work in-house. Um, there hasn't been a lot of um, 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 a desire on the county standpoint to take on additional work. Um, I think their their plate is pretty full, though. Um, Rob, I have a couple questions. To make sure I've always heard you say that the PCI index of seventy was the goal or standard. It wasn't necessarily. It was like acceptable, minimal acceptable level if all your streets were at a pavement index of 70. Is that correct? That's what the um, 
Um, C CTC, yeah. the California Transportation okay. Commission, has set as a goal okay. um, statewide. It's anything below um, 70 is kind of pavement at risk. 70 okay. and above right. is you're in fairly good shape. Mm -hmm. um, Just so people understand, 70 doesn't mean all brand new streets. It's no, it means, means an average of average. 70. You may have some in the 60s mm -hmm. and some in the 80s. Um, just an example, um, uh, Mr. Sauerwein, when he was here, he did some uh, calculations with our pavement management software and calculated to get and maintain a mm -hmm. average of 70 in town, we would need to spend an additional $1.7 million per year in addition to our approximately $500,000 measure Q allocation or about $2.2 .2 million a year to, to, get achieve, every street at to achieve that yeah. PCI wow. of 70. Um, if we do nothing, um, we will, in 20 years, we will be at a um, PCI of in the low 20s, below the 26, that if we're spending that $500,000 a year. $500,000 a year right now is about keeping our, head, our nose above the um, lapping high tide. So the 500K just keeps us even with where we are? Is that what you're saying? Or uh, and it will, but yeah. it will start to... The degree. Degrade, degrade time, because yeah. um, as I uh, started my story about the way streets were built, mm -hmm. um, those streets will end up failing because ceiling over the top of a um, street that was not built as a street only buys you some time. Um, you can okay. see that on, um, I think this first street that we did a triple layer on was tied. Um, and we can see those failures coming back through. And that was four years ago. So you said 63. Is that what the averages of the city streets now, the um, PCI? 63 was where we um, um, were at a few years ago. We brought that up to um, a 66 um, okay. by doing these advanced techniques. But um, we'll, we'll plateau, and then we'll start to degrade over time unless we change our, our methods, and which, which requires more funding. Um, to be honest with you, I don't see a, a, a real good way to, um, uh, given the current budget situation, mm -hmm. to do anything what we're doing right now. Um, my comment to start with is that I think, quite frankly, you've got an example where you did do a really good job from the year before to this last, and it had to do with bringing the A team instead of the B team to do the roads. I mean, the quality that I kind of casually observed two years ago versus what was recent was substantially different and with the same, the same capital outlay to some extent. So in other words, there are ways to be creative. John brought up a, a concept. I mean, saying that somebody's not interested isn't the where we should go. I mean, if we can share equipment with the county, Cayucas, Cambria, um, we all have the same issues. Are there other creative techniques? I know what about road repair. But as I said, just by bringing an A-team in, someone who is more qualified, we got a better product that will probably last longer. So my suspicion is there may be opportunities or different techniques, different approaches that are more long-term, not, not to fix it now, such that Ponderosa is not going to complain so much. Um, but is there sharing equipment. I, mean, I think that's a great idea. And that may not be one that will work. But I think thinking that way, if it were my own money, would I continue just plodding along or what I think more long term, uh, you know, such as what we need to be doing with the leaks in the sewer line. But anyway, I guess I offer to you to, are there other ways to make better use of the t money over time, such that in 10 years, this index is at 0.7? not at 0.5, with the same spending level. That's not what the predictive model would indicate, um, that we would need to do some major reconstruction um, to do that work. Now, um, I think the driver on pavement is the material, uh, the cost. Um, it's an oil-based product. Um, we've seen, when I started with the uh, city, um, uh, asphalt was 
80, 75, 80 dollars a yard. Um, we're paying right now close to 200 dollars a yard for um, raw asphalt, not placed. Go, go to the yard and pick it up. That is the um, um, one of the drivers on um, um, the cost of um, road reconstruction is that bare cost of materials. Um, um, labor has gone up also. Um, I think we could get creative in doing some of this own work by sharing equipment. Um, haven't given up on that. I think maybe more viable is to continue to work with the, when the new county public works director comes in, to work with them about um, sharing um, labor forces and, and equipment um, and contracting with the county to maybe do some additional work. I've seen that work in other places. John had a comment, I think. Did you? Yeah, I had another question. Uh, yeah, walking around during my uh, afternoon constitutionals, I noticed some base failures and stuff like that. Um, would there be any point in getting the appropriate equipment so that we could uh, repair base failures? We, we do have um, equipment to, we could do uh, base failure repairs, so, you know, patching a small area. So we have um, backhoe, um, we can saw cut, dig out, place base, um, repair that. Um, a lot of it comes down to, you know, staffing resources also. Um, we only have so many guys on the streets, consolidated maintenance, they're spread, um, they're doing building maintenance, they're cleaning bathrooms, and they're doing street repairs. Um, I've been told that uh, back in the 80s and 90s there was a seven person uh, streets crew and we owned our own paving equipment and they were busy every day um, doing overlays around town. Um, with two people on a streets crew you can barely um, do pothole repairs. What would you, if, if you were going to bring somebody on to do something more, do you think there might be any cost savings to, to have some you know, quick repair of, of the failures rather than waiting for the, the contract every year or two. So we, you know, through our work order program, um, uh, do those pothole repairs, um, dig out and repairs, um, and I think it would take um, a fairly significant investment in human resources to, we would add, need to add probably a couple more bodies to um, the crews to um, kind of keep up with those um, base failures. And I, quite honestly, I don't see that happening in the next couple of years, adding um, additional staffing. Thank you. Just a point of clarification, Rob. Uh, would you say some of that $200 a yard cost for asphalt has to do with the amount that is being currently purchased to do patching versus, you know, if you had a much larger job, would that cost per yard come down? Slightly. Um, there's um, limited suppliers on asphalt. Um, there's Union and there's Hansen. Um, they can kind of set the, the cost. We can't buy it in quantities like Caltrans does. In fact, when Caltrans does a job, you can forget about um, buying any asphalt because they'll t tie up the plants for, um, during their paving season for weeks at a time. Um, you're not buying any asphalt at all. Uh, the Mud Creek repair has wiped out the rock supply in uh, Central Valley. In, not just not just the central coast, but I mean in San Joaquin Valley, it's wiped out the supply there too. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then you know perhaps there would be some opportunities for some cooperative purchasing a consortium just based on on what the county does that we could participate for our part of it in that. I mean, you know, I'm I'm tossing it out there. Yeah. It's all, it's all yeah. time. It's all effort. I mean, it, it, and oh, yeah. I definitely and agree. It may not be practical, but you know, there that's definitely you know maybe we're thinking about. I think we have to look at different ways of, of doing things. You know, all these are great ideas and we'll run them as far as we can to, you know, see different ways to, um, um, you know, spend the uh, people's money wisely. Okay, anything else? Or we can move on. 
Go ahead, John. So, so, Rob, is your plan then to do the major paving work every two years or every year? Um, we, um, when Mr. Sarwan was here, he brought to us a kind of innovative way of contracting that I wasn't used to in local government, the indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery method, which he was used to in the federal government, where you bring a contractor on board for a multi-year contract. Um, we have pavement coatings, um, um, a contractor on board for um, another year that we would, uh, um, it saves some on mobilization, but we have um, fixed costs and we have uh, um, fixed escalation, negotiated escalation amount. So we know um, what those um, ceiling costs are going to be next year so we can plan better. Um, with this ID, IQ process. Now, we don't have an ID IQ process for um, pavement. Uh, we haven't done much paving in the last couple of years. We've done seal coating, um, triple layers, but a different type of contractor would do that paving, and we should look at the ID IQ con concept with a paving contractor also to lock in those prices so that we can kind of guarantee that certainty. I guess my point was, are, are we looking at having a half a million dollar holdover to the next year to do uh, two years worth of work in one fiscal year? Is that going to be the, your approach, or are you going to use a half a million per year? I think that's the advantage of the ID IQ contract is you've, you have that contractor locked in for multiple years, and you don't have to rely upon building up a fund and only doing it once every two years. And the other point that goes along with that is the measure Q has increased in the past few years yes. significantly. It was originally several years ago in the 700,000. Now it exceeds 1 million. So some years, remember, we started that every other year. We were only putting 350, 400. Wasn't enough. So couple that increase, couple the additional 200 that you'll get from the SB1 and some fuel tax money. And I think that gives, with your contract, gives you a significant boost that you can do something every year without paying huge setup, fixed price yes. setup costs. And just one last, um, hopefully this won't elicit too many more comment or questions, but um, you know the street maintenance isn't the only draw upon mm -hmm. um, you know kind of our gas tax funds. There's other things in the street that we need to maintain: curbs, gutters, sidewalks, street trees, storm drainage. You know, all gets kind of all draws from that same um, pot of money. And then if we want any betterments in the city, like we sh need to make some sort of improvements to um, the 41 main Highway 1 intersection. And unfortunately, haven't been able to convince the, the state of California so far that they need to be a major player in that game, too. Rob, one more. Sorry. Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that members of this committee noted was that over the years, Measure Q has paid very little in the way of storm drain maintenance. What is your opinion of the need in that area? We have a fairly small storm underground storm drain system, um, not like other cities where there's a almost a separate sewer system. Our storm drainage is mainly surface until you get down near the bay, then it goes subsurface and into the uh, water. The storm drain system that we do have out there is 50-year-old corrugated metal pipe. I think it's a, um, we're doing an assessment that right now with, um, as part of our one water plan and have a, we'll have a capital program. I don't think we'll have anywhere near the funding that's needed for that capital program. Most of the corrugated metal pipe that I've looked at, um, uh, maybe only the top half still exists. It's a tunnel um, through the soil. And um, you can see evidence of that. Uh, the latest one we found was on Quintana Road um, at about um, um, where the auto repair places are on the kind of the um, easterly section of Quintana Road. You'll, you'll see a hole developing there, and that's from the backfill going down into the, um, the pipe there. So we uh, need to get in there and uh, replace a section of that pipe. But um, that is another piece of infrastructure um, because of the materials that were used. And, you know, great materials, but they don't last forever. Okay. Anything else? 
Thank you, Rob. Okay, sorry for the all the oh, good no, news. Oh no, no, no apologies necessary. It's interesting. Very good, um, Jen. What are you looking f uh, for from us on the preparation of the Measure Q, or was this? Are you going to give us uh, a list, B list, or? So we haven't we haven't done lists yet. Um, okay. The revenue estimates that we have from HDL, our sales tax consultant, yeah. are one mm -hmm. million fifty five thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so we wanted to. There's been lots of questions on some of the work that's been done that I haven't been able to answer. So part of this was informational. Um, part of it was an opportunity for you to hear the needs of the department. Mm -hmm. And then the last part was if you would like to give any guidance as we prepare the A and B list and prepare what we bring forward in April, mm -hmm. we're happy to hear that and, mm -hmm. and consider that when we're developing the budget. Well, I think the guidance would be somewhat consistent with past years, uh, obviously uh, the fire station, the debt service, that 90,000, I think that's, we don't really have any alternatives right. for that. And the fourth firefighter to maintain the response call, um, that we've pretty much always done without question. And, and then the remaining items typically have been more what kind of equipment's needed, um, how much, you know, we need for pavement management. Yeah. Um, I think all three gentlemen have made a very good case for all of their requests. So I, I, I guess I would ask you to solicit requests from the departments and prioritize it. And if you want our input, I'm sure we'd be happy to give it, you know. So that'll come in April with the proposed. Okay. You'll, okay. you'll hear that. We just wanted to give you an advance as, yeah. as we well, work good. towards this more collaborative kind of, mm -hmm. you know, thing. If there was something specific you wanted to see or did not want to see or want to mm -hmm. recommend. We wanted to know that before we pre prepared the budget. Uh, have you been having discussions about creative ways to plug holes and possibly using Measure Q funds? There's kind of general conversations and they haven't been specific with Measure Q yet, but as we look at our donation accounts, as we look at Measure Q as some of the safety grant accounts that we have, what qualifies for expenditures that we can charge to those to kind of relieve the general fund. Have there been discussions of, of changing the percentage of allocations between the various departments? No, not yet. Thank you. In general, we have said that it will go for the police, fires, uh, safety, storm drain, and the only labor costs uh, which were presented before council years ago were on the fourth firefighter and the school resource officer. There were no, no other labor costs. So our, I think our direction would be we don't want to be using Measure Q to backfill, you know, general administrative expenses um, in terms of labor that... Uh, if you have to cut in any of the departments, you know, to meet your goals, you have to make some hard decisions. And um, I don't think we'd want to be using Measure Q to backfill those difficult decisions. We want to use Measure Q for the intention of the ballot initiative. I, I should have asked this when the fire chief was here, but I'm wondering if he's expecting um, any kind of uptick in disaster response and therefore an uptick in funding needed for disaster response. I think we're starting to see that across communities of California and how Measure Q might play into that would be just something I'd be interested in getting his take on that I didn't think of why he was here. Okay. Okay, good point. A lot of that's funded hopefully, but you know, through other agencies. Um, I see we're running out of time, Jennifer, so I, I need to, you know, do a quick time. Ch I believe, that, is there a meeting in here at 6 or 6.30? Six, six. 6. Okay, so we get, need to wrap this up in eight minutes. Number five, yeah. Uh, we're not going to get to number four, I don't think, although we included some of that comments in our discussion when the gentlemen were presenting. Um, but just real quickly, we probably won't have any subcommittee updates. I know ours doesn't, so, and Dave doesn't at this time. So uh, on item number five, the second quarter investment report, that's only one quick page. Um, I think John wanted to make a comment on that, and, um, and I reviewed it also in, in general concurrence with your recommendation. Go ahead, John. Well, just I think generally uh, your recommendation on the liquidity, I think that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I still would 
wonder about the amount that you have in the Rabobank accounts. Uh, I think we had mentioned that last time because they, they really are so low interest. I know those are pretty much operating accounts. At least the sweep account should be an operating account. Um, is there a way to integrate those more efficiently with uh, LAIF so that there's uh, more money kept in LAIF and less money kept locally? Yes, as, as the last couple CDs have matured and I haven't done anything with them, you know, they've, they've kind of sat in Rebel Bank. That's not the best um, practice. You're, you're absolutely right. So we'll um, work towards that 65 to 70 percent liquidity rate once we take this to council and then keep more in LAIF and less in Rebel Bank going forward. Okay, so you're already above the 65 to 75, it looks like, 83%. Okay. And I think you mentioned that in your staff report. Yes, some of these retired, you would look at them and, okay. Yes. Any other comments on the investment report? Is that satisfy your, yeah, okay. Um, all right, then um, that brings us pretty close to uh, the future agenda items. I think we'll, we'll Jen, uh, Jennifer, we can work on that. Yeah, for our, oh, our April meeting, you, we have that scheduled for Wednesday, April 25th. So that was a change from the regularly scheduled meeting and that was in order to give you a, a more comprehensive proposed budget. We should have okay. that um, more finalized by then. So that would be the primary focus of that meeting. Okay, so that's the last week of the month. That's on a Wednesday, same time, this location. Everybody agreeable to that? All right, any other closing comments before we adjourn? It's the 25th, Wednesday. Okay, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. 25th, Wednesday. Bailing up? Well.